This is the second installment of the Battle of Jutland Saga and the 17th episode of the First World War Chronicles. So if you want to stay in the know about the First World War, hit that subscribe button. It was a classic battle of wits between the German High Seas Fleet and the British Royal Navy Grand Fleet. Hipper of Germany and Beatty of England were the vanguard commanders of both sides, and they went head to head for a few rounds. Hipper managed to lure Beatty into a trap set by Shear, and Beatty quickly realized he was in a tight spot and ordered his fleet to retreat to the side of the British Grand Fleet. Thinking they had the Brits in their grasp, the Shear fleet on the German side gave chase at full speed, only to find themselves in the very trap they had set for the British. At about 6 o'clock in the evening of May 31, 1916, the main forces of the British fleet led by Beatty and Jellicoe converged, both fleets turned eastward, and under the command of Jellicoe, 24 British battleships, lined up in a column 15,000 yards long, pounced on the German fleet, ready to seize at the vantage point of the T-head. Back in the days of big battleships and cannons, the most important thing in a sea battle was to take control of the T-formation. What does that mean? It's when two fleets meet and one of them forms a line across the other so that their front and rear cannons can fire at the enemy while the enemy can only fire back with their front cannons. So, it's really important to get that T-formation. The Beatty fleet also changed course and kept fighting the Hipper. At 6.17 p.m., the most classic scene in the history of human sea warfare was officially staged. In front of the fleet advancing northward, a line of 24 British battleships and seven battlecruisers appeared. At Jellicoe's command, the main guns of the 24 battleships fired simultaneously, like hail, smashing the German fleet. In just 13 minutes, Shear's vanguard and Hipper's battleships were covered by 14 rounds of heavy artillery fire. The battlecruiser Koenig ignited a raging fire, and the sailors on board jumped into the sea to escape. Hipper's flagship, the Lutzo, was bombed and the side deck was flooded. The Cambridge of the Von du Tan was blown away, and the deck was full of dead and injured sailors. Shear's flagship, the Kaiser, also ate several heavy shells, and the formation was disrupted. Shear had no idea he was walking into a trap. The British had been waiting for him all along, and the situation was looking pretty grim for the Germans. Shear had his fleet in a line formation, which didn't allow them to use their firepower to its full potential, so he quickly ordered them to turn around and head back. Little did he know, the fleet they were chasing, Beatty's, had already circled around and cut off their escape route. Shear had no choice but to order the German fleet to turn southwest and flee. It usually takes half an hour to make such a maneuver, but Shear managed to do it in just a few minutes. Even Jellicoe, watching from the command center, couldn't help but admire the German fleet's agility. But admiration doesn't win wars, and the British were about to give chase when the Germans made a last-ditch effort and turned around. That's when Hood, commanding the 3rd Battlecruiser Squadron, gave chase and engaged Tipper's fleet in a fierce battle. Hood's flagship, the HMS Invincible, was hit by several shells, and the ammunition magazine exploded, splitting the ship in two and sending 1,026 crew members to the bottom of the sea in a blaze of fire. The mighty battleship Marlborough was hit by a torpedo, filling the boiler room with seawater and leaving it spinning in place. Jellicoe, seeing the situation, decided to call off the pursuit of the German fleet, which was heading southwest and further away from their homeland. Shear, looking back, noticed that Jellicoe had stopped chasing them and figured he must be waiting somewhere. Shear weighed his options and, knowing that speed was his advantage, decided to turn around and fight his way back. He led his fleet in an attempt to break through the tail of the British fleet and eventually make a bloody path back to Germany. At 7 o'clock in the evening, Shear's fleet was approaching the British fleet again. Surprisingly, Shear's advisors didn't do well in math, and the fleet deviated from its course, not heading to the rear of the Royal Navy, but directly into the center of the fleet. The British, in a daze, formed a T-shaped formation, which made Jellicoe ecstatic. Is this Shear a German? He should be awarded the British Navy Medal. Shear's name is well deserved. The two fleets opened fire at a distance of 8,000 meters. 
Shear ordered the fleet to attack with torpedoes, while commanding Hipper's four battleships to launch a suicide attack to cover the main force's retreat. Hipper shouted Long Live William II and charged forward, and the fleet escaped under the cover of Smoke and Hipper. Unfortunately, Hipper wasn't so lucky. His flagship, the Lutzo, was completely disabled and sunk after being forced to abandon ship. Hipper transferred to the Mao, a strategic cruiser, to command, but the Mao and the other two strategic cruisers were also in bad shape, taking on a lot of water. If the British had fired a few more rounds of simultaneous shots at this time, they would have all sunk. Lucky for Jellicoe, he had the foresight to turn his fleet eastward to avoid the torpedoes, allowing Hipper to escape. By 8 o'clock, the night had fallen and Jellicoe decided to stay put and wait for Shear's fleet to return, ready to pounce and annihilate them. Jellicoe, puffing on his pipe, smugly told his officers that tomorrow would be a glorious day for the Royal Navy. Shear, too, realized that if his fleet couldn't break out of the encirclement under the cover of darkness, they'd be in for a rough ride come morning. After careful analysis and calculations, Shear adjusted his course and had to break out from the rear of the British fleet. To this end, all available destroyers were sent out to lay down a smokescreen of torpedoes to protect the main force's breakout. At the sound of Shear's command, German destroyers attacked like a pack of wolves from different directions, leaving the British completely confused and unable to figure out the Germans' movements. At half past eleven at night, the Grand Fleet and the Royal Navy's Regard Fleet encountered each other, staging the final act of the Battle of Jutland. The two sides, with the help of flares, searchlights and the fire from the ships, exchanged fire in the melee. The British armored cruiser HMS Black Prince charged into the middle of the German fleet, attracting the siege of four battleships. Black Prince immediately became the dead prince. Soon after, a German old battleship and two light cruisers were also sunk. The battlecruiser SMS Seidlitz was hit by a torpedo and the cabin was flooded with water. Fortunately, the power system of the warship was not paralyzed and it could still follow the main force slowly. After a melee, Scheer finally broke through the British blockade line and ran wildly towards Wilhelmshaven. After World War I broke out, the German Navy laid countless mines in the German waters. The position of the mines was like a maze. Only the Germans knew the waterways through the minefield. At half past three in the morning, the darkest moment before dawn, Scheer checked the compass direction and found the entrance of the waterway, commanding the fleet to form a line, one following the other, safely passing through the minefield. The British fleet, following closely behind, could only fire a few shots, not daring to cross the minefield. At four o'clock, the British Navy intercepted a German telegram saying that the Scheer fleet had safely passed through the minefield and was heading back to base. So, Jellico, it's time for you to come back too. There's no point in waiting around. The Royal Navy had to retreat and the unprecedented Battle of Jutland was over. The battle may be over, but the story isn't finished yet. The legendary journey home of the German battleship Seidlitz was quite something during the German fleet's return voyage. Despite being hit by 22 armor-piercing shells and a torpedo, all its gun turrets were destroyed and the hull was riddled with holes, taking on water and leaking oil. But the German sailors still refused to abandon ship and bravely set sail for home with the rest of the fleet. At first, the Sitterers could sail at a speed of 22 knots, but as the water intake increased, it became increasingly difficult to control. If the speed was too fast, the seawater would flood the hull, so it had to sail at a low speed of seven knots. What was even more deadly was that the water intake was so high that the draft of the warship was 13 meters. This draft was how deep the parts below the waterline of the warship were. With a height of 13 meters, it was always in danger of running aground. There was nothing to be done. As soon as the captain found that the water ahead was too shallow, he had to order the warship to go full speed and scrape the bottom of the sea. After two hours of arduous trekking, the Sitterers finally passed through the shallow waters. After all the operations, the water intake of the hull had reached more than 5,000 tons, which was one-fifth of its own displacement. The hull bow was almost completely submerged, and there was always a danger of sinking. 
At the moment of danger, the captain issued an unusual order again, letting the ship sail in reverse at full speed, with the stern becoming the bow, in order to reduce the impact of water intake as much as possible. Finally, the Ceteris reversed into the dock and completed this miraculous return journey. The Battle of Jutland was the biggest naval battle of World War I and the only time the British and Germans went head-to-head -head in a big showdown. After the battle, both sides claimed victory, but looking at the results, the Royal Navy lost three battleships, three cruisers, and eight destroyers, totaling 115,000 tons, while the German High Seas Fleet lost one old battleship, one battleship cruiser, four light cruisers, and five destroyers, totaling 61,000 tons. The losses were nearly two to one in favor of the Germans, so they had the upper hand. If we talk about the battle process, the British had the upper hand, taking the initiative throughout and twice occupying the advantageous T position. In the end, the German fleet had to flee in disarray. The reason why the British couldn't turn their advantage into victory was largely due to their ship design. British warships emphasized speed and firepower, sacrificing armor. The Germans, on the other hand, reduced speed and firepower while emphasizing better protection. In the crucial fire control system, German warships were much superior. This was because after the Battle of Dogger Bank, they sealed and modified the ammunition storage and ammunition conveyor and replaced the tool for transporting ammunition with sealed metal containers. So even if the turret was hit, it would only be unable to fire, rarely catching fire or exploding ammunition. The British warships, without any modifications to their safety, had their ammunition stored in silk bags, which meant that if they were hit in the turret, the ammunition would basically blow up with them, so after the Battle of Jutland, Beatty lamented that they had to admit that the German ships were superior to theirs. The battle was a draw, but strategically speaking, the British were the clear winners of the Battle of Jutland, as the German Navy was unable to break the Royal Navy's blockade despite their best efforts. The German high seas fleet, which had managed to escape, never dared to challenge the British again until the end of the war, earning them the title of fleet in being. Some have criticized Admiral Scheer for being too cowardly, saying that if he had chosen to fight to the death instead of running away when he encountered the main force of the Royal Navy, the outcome might have been different. Looking at the strength of both sides at that time, it was right to choose to run away. His battleships and battlecruisers were only 26, while the British had 32, including 381 mm, 356 mm, 343 mm, and 305 mm main guns of the British Navy, while the Germans had 305 mm and 283 mm, the gap in caliber was real. In addition to the main fleet, the gap in the number of small and medium sized ships between the two sides was even greater. In the Battle of Jutland, the Germans only sent 11 light cruisers and 61 destroyers, while the Royal Navy had 8 armored cruisers, 26 light cruisers, and 79 destroyers. With such a huge disadvantage, if Scheer had come up with a mindless charge at that time, it was very likely that the whole army would have been wiped out. Well, with the German Navy blocked in the harbor by the Royal Navy, they had to think of a way to still cause trouble for the Brits. So, all they had left was their submarines. We all know the German U-boats were pretty powerful during World War II, but it turns out they had a tradition of being pretty good at it during World War I too. So, subscribe to my channel and stay tuned for the next video where I'll tell you all about the German U-boats of World War I.